we got Jason on the line. What do you want to ask him? As investors, we don't want to create more jobs for ourselves. We want to create a machine that can run on its own with little maintenance and care. So what's something that you guys have put in place that has actually freed up time in your schedule to spend with family or, or mm -hmm. friends? I do think leveraging technology helps. I would say a virtual assistant is what helped take us to the next level in giving us time to focus on other areas of the business. Hey, I'm Brian Briscoe, host of the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. And this podcast is different from everything else out there. I bring together new and aspiring investors on each and every episode and let the aspiring investors ask the questions that they need answered. And if you're an aspiring investor yourself, you probably have the same questions. So before you get to this episode that we have prepared for you, make sure you hit the subscribe button and that little notification bell to make sure you get notified every time we post a new episode. And now enjoy the show. Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe, you know, founder of Streamline Capital and the Tribe of Titans multifamily investment community. So we're doing a Ask the Expert episode today. We've got two great guests on the line with us. We have Jason Bake and Mason Mattioni. So gentlemen, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having us on. Awesome. This is going to be a lot of fun. So Jason's our experienced investor today. So Jason, you're up first. How's it going? Good, good. A lot going on as we prep for uh, an upcoming investor summit, but uh, nice. always like time to, to meet people and, and chat. Yeah. Tell us about the investor summit. Since you mentioned it, I'm curious. Yeah, it's going to be in Cincinnati in about a week and a half. We are flying all of our investors from uh, across the country to come see our properties. Nice. Uh, take a day of having a good time, seeing some real estate and hopefully networking. Nice. So your investors are going to the properties that they presumably invested in. You're going to show and tell. Yeah. I love that. That sounds pretty cool. It came out of feedback. A lot of people, you know, if they invest remotely, they never get to see the asset or touch it. Mm -hmm. So trying to do our best to keep our investor relations. Nice. Yeah. I think, you know, with the way things are right now with social media, you know, looking at my investments, you know, most people are remote. It's not very often where people actually get to see the bricks and mortar they invest in. So just curious, do you mainly do C-class, B-class? What do your properties typically look like? We have done C-class assets in B-class areas, but okay. given the recent shift of the market, we're actually looking to go up in both class of the property and of the neighborhood. Okay. So yeah, historically a lot of value add deals, yep. but we're pivoting and evolving. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We did have one investor who was driving through the town where we had a property and it was a C class in a B area. It was a seventies build and we had a pretty hefty renovation budget for the property because when we bought it, it was rough. And I remember his comments when he went there, he's like, man, this place looks pretty. It's not what I was expecting. And my, you know, I, I just kind of laughed and he's like, it's not how the pictures looked. Uh, anyway, I laughed. I'm like, wait till we're done with it. You know, wait mm -hmm. till we're done with it. You know, there, there's a reason we're putting in $20,000 a unit on this property. Mm -hmm. But wow. anyway, sounds like a cool thing for you, but let's dive in and talk about you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I am managing principal and co-founder of Compounding Capital Group. Mm -hmm. Me and my business partner, we invest mo uh, mostly out of Cincinnati, but okay. also in other parts of Dayton and Columbus. I kind of just mentioned we're, we're typically value add investors and okay. operators. So we are lead sponsors on the deals that we take down in Ohio. We're the ones that are managing the contractors, dealing with financing, mm -hmm. you know, doing construction draws, putting the team together and all that. Overall, uh, I've got about 300 plus units across the country, Pennsylvania, Alabama, South Carolina, but mm -hmm. our primary focus today is Ohio. Ohio. Okay. Uh, yeah. I used to actually do single family homes on mm -hmm. my own. Decided it was kind of bullshit <laughs> and decided to, to pursue greener pastures to try and scale up a little faster. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've been investing full time for about two and a half years now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people do that. A lot of people start with a single family and, you know, they do exactly what you were doing, uh, what you do and try to transition to multifamily. So mm -hmm. since, since I think we probably have a lot of listeners that would like to hear that, what did you find to be the biggest challenge transitioning from single family to multifamily? I can take a step back and also mention the transition between zero units to single family homes as well. So uh, I had a corporate day job, was a data scientist for about a decade. Mm -hmm. And I quit when I had absolutely no real estate experience. I barely understood how a house kept itself together, mm -hmm. but I figured that I'd take a chance on myself for the first time in my life. Yeah. So I quit my day job with zero units, hadn't even bought my own house before. Yeah. Uh, and I started off with, with single family homes. Mm -hmm. And the first... 
uh, deal I ever did was actually a portfolio of six at okay. once because I made the brilliant decision to start investing in the height of COVID mm -hmm. when uh, real estate was incredibly overpriced and expensive. Yeah. And the only way that I could make the numbers work was if I could buy at a discount. Mm -hmm. I mean, real estate investing and being an entrepreneur are very different from being a, you know, an employee at a yeah. large company. Definitely, arguably the hardest year of my life, that first year of trying to get traction with single families. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, mentality shifts, a lot of making mistakes, but thankful that I did everything that I did. Thankful for the mistakes that I made at a small scale so that I could learn from them and, and move on to multifamily. Yeah. And then even shifting from singles to, to multis. Mm -hmm. I realized that single family homes wasn't necessarily a business. Uh, and I hate to say that if I'm offending any, you know, single family home investors, but you can do it on your own. You can yeah. do it with your own money. You don't really have to have partners. You don't really have to have processes or systems. Like maybe if you're doing some, you know, mm -hmm. direct to mail campaigns to try and get leads. But when you're looking to shift to larger assets, that's when you have to start focusing on real estate investing as as a business because it's mandatory. Unless you're already rich and you can take down, you know, a 50 unit apartment complex on your own, you're going to have to have partners, you're going to have to learn how to scale the right way with with systems and processes. So, uh definitely a big shift, but I personally enjoyed it because I came from corporate America where everything was systematized and process oriented yeah. and I had a lot of teammates, a lot of people I managed, I had bosses. And multifamily is a lot closer to that corporate life than, than single families was. Yeah. And I think you're right. All you said about, you know, most most people don't treat single family like a business. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's that that's that's something that was painfully obvious when I started doing multifamily. It's like, wait, 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 wait. There's a lot more business aspect to this than I ever really did with single family. And with single family, um, I do know a couple of people that have you know, really turn single family investing into a business, but I think they're few and far between, but mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. So, so, so good, good lessons there. And um, how, so I want to go back to, to one thing, you know, leaving your, your job before having assets, you know, what, what were your feelings going on with that? I mean, were you, were you scared? Were you nervous? Were you excited? I mean, what was, uh, what was that like for you? Yeah, all the above. I uh, have never been a big risk taker in my opinion yeah. you know i went to a, a decent school got a decent job had the golden handcuffs where i was making too much money to, to quit and mm -hmm. even if i hated my job on on any given day the the paycheck every single two weeks was was kind of nice and so the the inflection point for me was i think i made the decision when i was like 25 I, i'm in my 30s now but when i was 25 i was looking at my calendar and I realized that I had to do this for the next 40 years in order to retire mm -hmm. at 65. Yeah. And I, maybe I was having a particularly bad day that day, but it just didn't make sense for me. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I had to do something. Otherwise, I was going to be on this hamster wheel for yeah. forever. Um, and I mean, I'm not one of those people that villainizes uh, mm -hmm. corporate jobs or W-2 jobs. I feel like it serves a great purpose for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, but just as a personal choice, I knew that I had always had an entrepreneurial bug. And yeah. uh, if, if I wasn't going to do it in the near future, I was probably never going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I applaud you for that. I mean, I for, for the longest time, I think I always I had the entrepreneurial bug. But, you know, when I was just starting out with young kids, you know, I was the, the W-2 fit me a little more. You know, mm -hmm. I was looking for I was looking for that stable paycheck because, you know, um, yeah, when, when you have little kids, you know, I, I think that the worst thing for me was what if I fail? And it, it, a lot of it was was fear more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I don't villainize the W-2 either. I think uh, there there was a time in my life where that was exactly what I wanted, exactly what I needed. So, um, but there, there came another time where it was just like, okay, you know, I've done this long enough. Now it's time for me to to do other things. I think I think you hit that a lot, lot earlier in life than I did. So yeah. Um, <laughs> It, it's funny that you mentioned kids, though, because uh, yeah. I made the decision because I don't have kids yet. Like I'm married. I've been married for a few years. So my like relationship life mm -hmm. is stable, but I know how lazy I am. Like if I had a crying baby on my shoulder, no way I'd be working yeah. at 10 p.m. at night taking investor calls. Yeah. So I figured I had a small window that I, if I missed, I was going to have to delay it another 18 years. Yeah. And I, I I had a perfect window a couple of years ago to 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 jump ship and, and start doing this. I mean, it's 
uh, I think there there are there are certain windows where it's easier, and uh, mm-hmm. you hit one of them. You know, no, no kids yet, and you know, I, I've hit another one where you know my my youngest is seven. You know, so they're all at school right now, and I'm uh-huh. home by myself. Peace and quiet. So, so. Well, cool. Let's let's talk about uh, one of these properties you've done. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip the script a little bit. So let, let's talk more about your why. You know, the the reason why you're doing this. So, what would you say your big burning why is? I don't have a big appetite for consumerism. Mm-hmm. I grew up to poor immigrant parents. We don't, never really had much growing up, so I, I never had anything to miss. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I try not to be critical of of other people who you know like fancy toys. It's just not for me. Yeah. So my why is predominantly focused just on time with mm-hmm. friends and family. That's all I really want. Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to buy back my time essentially so that I could eventually get to a point where I have enough money so that I can wake up every single day and just choose what to do. If I want to spend 18 hours working, cause I'm super excited for what I'm doing that day. Awesome. If I want to spend the entire day, just watching Netflix and eating ice cream with my wife. Also awesome. So uh, yeah, really not necessarily focused on unit count or net worth because uh, I don't really have a need for a big unit count or a big net worth. But mm-hmm. yeah, just trying to to get to a level where I can take care of myself first and foremost and my wife, but hopefully also help my immediate family, friends, and other people in my community. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate you for sharing that. All right. Um, now we'll talk about one of the properties you've done. So tell us, tell us about one of the uh, one of the deals you guys have done, and give us an idea of what type of things you guys do. Uh, yeah. So last year we did a, a small syndication, thirty six units mm-hmm. that was uh, in a pretty good area of Dayton mm-hmm. that has mm-hmm. been performing pretty well. We typically do big value add deals where we might buy a uh, thirty unit. 50 unit apartment complex, clean it all out. Uh, so it's completely empty and then spend six months renovating. But this was a little bit unique in that it was already stabilized in that the tenant base was solid. The occupancy was kind of high, but we decided to pursue it because it fits the shifting narrative in real estate where we had to find assets in better areas mm-hmm. uh, and deals that didn't need so much of a, of a heavy lift just because we had other assets going on. And we couldn't really replicate that specific strategy of doing complete evictions and six months mm-hmm. of renovations for, for every single deal that we were managing. Yep. And uh, it, we syndicated it mm-hmm. uh, and it's been going pretty well so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've had to shift our strategy because we were planning to renovate most units to modern standards so that we can increase rents by, let's say, 200, 250 bucks. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Uh, last few months have been really rough across the country for leasing. Yep. There's no new tenants that want to move. Everyone wants to kind of stay put. Yep. So we've got to shift our strategy to doing less renovations and trying to keep our rents sort of middle of the market instead of near the top. Mm-hmm. And we're also trying to push our, our lease renewals because tenants, we, we are suffering from no new tenants wanting to come to our asset, but we are benefiting from our current tenants wanting to stick around. So uh, we're trying to find a fine balance, yeah. but um, this is an interesting deal because we actually found it on Redfin. It was okay. publicly listed by a residential broker. 36 and, unit though. That's, that's a little high yeah. to find on Redfin. So it, okay. that, that was our surprise too. Uh, we we have found one other deal mm-hmm. on like a Zillow or Redfin that I think was like 20, 20 some units, maybe a little less. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a funny story that I like to tell because mm-hmm. it was clear from the get-go when we were working with the seller's broker that she was a residential Mm -hmm. real estate agent. She didn't really have any idea of cap rates or Mm -hmm. even NOI. She kind of just (laughs) expected it to sell. So uh, yeah, it was a a nice opportunity. Uh, It it was a bit underpriced. So we were able to get at a discount, but only because we were looking in an area that not a lot of multifamily investors check. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, well, it sounds like a good deal. And I think a lot of people have been pivoting, you know, because of uh, what's happened in in the economy, obviously. I mean, interest rates are higher. Um, a lot of times seller expectations haven't come down. And so you're, you're trying to, you know, squeeze a lot, a lot of returns from not a lot of juice, you know, so to speak, or, um, Mm -hmm. but anyway, that's a good pivot. I I think, I think smaller sometimes is better right now. Um, But uh, yeah, when you, when you find a good deal, you, 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 you still do it is the answer. So. Yeah, exactly. We we've actually also 
been having continuing conversations where, I mean, last year we did like a 250 unit syndication, a 93 unit syndication. Uh, we took down a 63 unit, but we are also seeing a lot more opportunities in the smaller deals because institutional sellers don't really have any incentive to reduce their prices. Mm -hmm. So the mom and pops are the ones that are, you know, still motivated to sell and having to lower their prices because the competition on the buyer side isn't as high. Yeah. So uh, even today we're under contract for, you know, a 30 unit mm -hmm. that uh, is a lot easier for us to make work. I mean, we, we yeah. made an offer a few months ago on like 115 unit. It's just, we're just so far from being able to, to negotiate something though. Yeah. You know, and, and something, something that I've realized, I mean, if, if somebody's held a property for a while, even though prices are a little bit down right now, I mean, if you've held the property for five years, you're still going to make a decent profit. You know, if you've right. held the property for three years, you're probably still going to make a decent profit. If you bought last year, you're probably not going to want to sell right now. It's kind of where we're at in the marketplace. So, um, you know, we've, we've sold a couple of properties recently and had a couple of properties fall out of a contract and um, from one perspective, it's like, man, this is what we could have got if that buyer would have come through. And this is what we're looking at now. But from the other perspective, if you compare it to our original underwriting three, four years ago, it's like, we're still better off than, I mean, this is, this is better than we projected. So, mm -hmm. you know, it depends on, uh, where, where you, where you sit on that one, but, uh, well, cool. So last question, what's next for you? We are continuing to, to grow our portfolio in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. We are trying to figure out what our specific niche is, just because the world has changed a bit. We thought we were going to go for bigger assets this year, but a lot more success in, in making offers for smaller deals. Uh, but we're not syndicators. We are operators first and foremost. So we typically leverage other people that are able to get capital. So uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of overhead. We don't have a lot of employees. We have a, a, an assistant that we pay. So we try to stay lean. So that keeps us flexible to kind of uh, pivot with whatever the, the market tells us to pivot to. Nice. So we're going to keep growing in, in Cincinnati. Uh, I personally started an education arm of our business where we mm -hmm. also want to make sure that we are showing people a little bit more about the back end of mm -hmm. how to operate a business, how to analyze a business, how to asset manage. Because I feel like a lot of the content out there today is focused on acquisitions, yeah. which is mm -hmm. amazing. But there's a lot more years of, of hard work after you close. Yeah. So yeah, we're starting an education arm uh, and working much more on content and brand building this year yeah. as we continue to also grow our portfolio. Yeah. You know, and that's that's uh, interesting you say that just because you know more people are willing to pay money to to learn how to get their first apartment than they are to asset manage things. You know, so I think there's a reason why it's like that. I would like to see more asset management. I mean, in fact, you know, the closest book to me you know, is about asset management because, you know, that's, that is an important topic. But uh, anyway, uh, for those of you who are listening, if you're not on YouTube, I, I just picked up a book and it's, it's best in class by Gary Lipsky and Kyle Mitchell. So um, anyway, that said, we're going to shift gears and bring Mason on. So Mason, welcome. Yeah. Hey guys. Thanks Brian for bringing me on. Um, I'm Mason. I live in the Seattle area. I'm originally from Sacramento, I went to school up in Spokane, Washington mm -hmm. to study mechanical engineering. My dream was always to to work on airplanes and mm -hmm. and uh, get into the aerospace industry and to work for a big aerospace firm. Yep. And I was fortunate that's that's exactly the job I was able to land out out of college, and mm -hmm. it's still the job I have now. Yep. Um, and 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 I'm liking it. And about a year and a half ago, there is there's a day that that changed my life. I got back from work one day. Mm -hmm. And my wife shares the great news that we're pregnant. And so it's just got me thinking like, holy cow, like I got to, you know, provide for my wife and, and another human being, you know, I, yeah. I this, this baby's coming in nine months. I, and it got me thinking about money, money specifically. And around that same time, um, I was listening to a podcast and somebody from, from bigger pockets, David Green was, was the guest. He was talking about real estate mm -hmm. and investing in real estate and what that means. And it was the first time I had heard of that concept. I'm like, you know, people earn money from real estate. Like, what? I thought you just, you know, go to your nine to five job, earn some money and go back home. And you do that mm -hmm. um, until, until you retire. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of people do, by the way. I mean, a lot of people yeah. do that. Yeah. And so I, the, the first nine months of last year, 
I dove into learning. I, I just studied real estate, real estate investing, the real estate asset classes, um, and the different terminology and what it all means. And mm -hmm. last fall, I wanted to take action. I joined my first mastermind, mm -hmm. and I knew multifamily was was the way I wanted to go. And so this is the year of action. Uh, I'll be getting into my first uh, apartment complex this year. Nice. And um, I've been calling brokers and owners and submitting LOIs and, you know, moving forward and uh, really taking action. And so that's what I'm focusing on this year. And so th thank you guys for bringing me on for this opportunity to, to ask them some good questions. Love it. Love it. Yeah. There, there, there's a lot of goodness when you get into masterminds, when you get around other people who are you know, doing the same thing that you're, you're trying to do or trying to do the same thing, depending on the, the mastermind, but uh, well, cool. So, um, I mean, you talked a little bit and I, I think I know where your big burning why is going to go, but let's, let's, uh, let's focus on that for a minute. And what is your why? Yeah, sure. So I was very fortunate to grow up with two, two parents that were really present at home mm -hmm. um, due to the, the nature of their jobs. They were just always around. And I didn't, I, I sort of took that for granted as a kid, even though I didn't try to, but as I grew up, I'm like, holy cow, I was very lucky to have two parents that mm -hmm. were always around. They were always at sports and just, you know, taking me on backpacking trips and stuff. And so naturally it's my inclination to really want to do that for my daughter now. And so that's really, really my why is to be there and it, for my daughter and for my wife and, and to spend time with family at home mm -hmm. and to not be the, the dad that's just off at work somewhere. And that's just, you know, who knows where dad is. I want to be there, be there for my family. And, and the other reason is to give back to the community. I'm, I'm a Catholic. And if you're familiar with the Catholic mass, the, mm -hmm. the ushers go up and down the pews during the middle of mass and they collect money for the church. Mm -hmm. And growing up, going to church, that was was actually my favorite, my favorite part because my dad gave me his cash to put in the basket, yeah. and I, I felt like I was I was contributing to the church, yeah. and so I want to be able to do that without having it feel like it's you know taking a burden on any financial situation uh -huh. for my family. So I want to be able to give back generously to the church, and that's that's my second reason. Love it, love it. Good, good answers there. So. I'll tell you what I was doing this morning. I, I took my kids to school, you know, and not not a lot of dads do that very often. You know, not a lot of dads can because they're they're usually at work when when kids are going to school. But uh, I take my kids to school every day, and most days I'm I'm home when they get home. So um, it's something you can definitely get to doing doing what we're doing. So that said, we got Jason on the line. What do you want to ask him? Yeah. So I've got some questions more about systems, Jason. You're Let's say you're a new investor who found an apartment complex, you analyzed it, conducted due diligence while under contract, and you just closed. What's your next move to streamline the renovation period and ensure that the process goes as smoothly as possible while your investors stay happy? And in other words, what, what's the actual system that you put in place once you once you close on that building? Yeah. Uh, interesting. That's, that's a loaded question. It's, it's a big question. Mm -hmm. because I think there is a bit of a misconception that there is one system that just magically makes multifamily stabilization really easy. And the reality is, is that it's hundreds of systems that are laid on top of one another. And I don't think there's anything that I would say makes all of that super straightforward. For example, the renovation side, it really depends on who you are using to renovate. Are you hiring your own contractors? In which case, you're going to have to be on them for a while. You're going to have to make sure that you don't give them every single dollar up front. Make sure you pay them over installments. If you're going through your property management company, you have to make sure that you're on top of your property management company and you meet with them on a weekly basis to ensure that they're keeping a trap of uh, on top of their own employees to, to make sure that your renovations are on schedule and on budget. Uh, that is different also from the world of keeping investors happy. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that communication is key. Uh, you have to try to be as empathetic as possible to a friend or a colleague that gave you 50, 100 grand. If you never hear from that person for a year, you're going to be pretty worried about how your money is performing. So on the investor relations front, we try to give monthly updates and then as the property gets more stabilized and there's just nothing new to update people on, we'll shift that to six weeks and then eventually quarterly. Mm -hmm. So uh, part of 
the success of stabilization uh, is having the mindset to be process oriented, but there is no one process that makes everything magically happen at the same time. Like I, I've got a process that's really efficient at doing one small thing, which is maybe updating our rent roll that I give to my assistant. Uh, and she does it perfectly every single time, but that's a very small sliver of making sure that the property is stabilized properly and also that your investors are happy. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, there's a lot of hard work that goes into being an asset manager and most of it is not glamorous, but it's, it's, I think instead of a specific process, I would recommend making sure that you just have the mentality that you just have to be organized. And I think that that helps tremendously make sure that you don't lose something in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing we do with every new acquisition is everything Jason says, I, I agree with there, there, There's not nothing there that I'm you know going to counter, but we basically come up with a roadmap, you know, with a, we call it a, a transition plan, but we come up with our own transition plan and it's like, okay, where are we on this property now? Where are we going? And every property is going to be slightly different. Some of them are going to need, you know, more renovations. Some of them are going to have, you know, fewer renovations. You know, some of them are going to have different problems, but we, we come up with our roadmap and we sit down with the property manager. We exclusively use third-party management companies. So we're sitting down with the property manager and we're, we're, we're walking them through. This is our vision. We seek their input, you know, but something else we do is we keep track of, you know, some certain dates that I think are important and, you know, when we're when we're on our weekly weekly call, we make sure we understand what's going on. And what I mean by these dates is, you know, there certain localities have rules on when rent is deemed late. You know, so you know, here's here's the date. You know, rent is is late. And then the the property management company has a certain process that they go through, and we make sure that they're going through the process. You know, so we, we're going to ask them questions. You know, how many late rents did we have? Okay, did you did you put the notices out? Okay. And then, you know, the next date we keep track of is, you know, when can we, when can we file for evictions in, in each locality? And especially up front, this is, this is extremely important because when tenants start seeing that we're filing for eviction, the delinquency rate goes down really, really quickly. So yeah, we, we just keep track of those dates. We, we know, you know, when the asset manager, we're looking at those dates and we know, you know, when our property manager should be doing certain things. And so when we're on our, our call with the property manager, we're always asking, hey, how are the eviction? How many evictions did you file last week? You know, last week was the, the date we had, you know, last we talked, we had two delinquent, you know, did you file evictions, you know, and Anyway, that's 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 part of our process. Yeah, I like that, Brian. I guess just to add to that too, where there's a lot of technology that can make that a lot easier. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally use Asana yeah. uh, and Slack for communication. I try to also get our property management company on a, onto Asana so I can tag them and mm -hmm. stuff, make sure that they're held accountable. A lot of property management companies will also have like Appfolio or Buildium yeah. that they should be keeping updated so that anytime you want to log on, you can see the rent roll. You can see who paid. You can see how many rental applications you have. So being data driven, I think, is incredibly important because if a investor asks you, hey, how is this property performing? The last thing you want to do is say, oh, I'm not really sure, right? Because it's your job to be on top of things. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you do this too, Brian, or maybe it's just me because I am you know, have a bit background in data, but I have, a, I have a giant asset management spreadsheet as well. That's a, a Google sheet. Yeah. But it houses everything from uh, records from our bank accounts to, mm -hmm. to make sure that every single thing that we're being charged makes sense, mm -hmm. that I flag for specific units and for the type of renovation that was done. Mm -hmm. uh, it tracks our, you know, when our taxes or insurance are due. Uh, it tracks, you know, our NOIs. It, it tracks how many applications we got versus how many showings versus, you know, mm -hmm. how many uh, people actually converted to tenants. So there's a lot of stuff yeah. that you can do to make things more organized. Would definitely recommend at least starting off with like Asana because it's yeah. at least good to, to work with teams with. Have something in place that does the updating. And Asana is just a project management tool if, if mm -hmm. people aren't familiar with it. We have KPI spreadsheets on each property and yeah, we're, we're tracking our KPIs on each one. And at one point, you know, in a previous partnership, we had one, one document to rule them all, but um, I don't have a master document right now. And I probably should. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, thanks for those answers. That was great. So my second question, uh, as investors, 
we don't want to create more jobs for ourselves. We want to create a machine that can run on its own with little maintenance and care. So what's something that you guys have put in place that has actually freed up time in your schedule to spend with family or, or friends or people close to you and allow you to do something that, that you like and like free up time in your schedule? Uh, interesting. Again, I don't mean to be like a contrarian, but real estate, I also thought was going to be much more scalable mm -hmm. back when I first started. But being in the thick of things today, uh, it's it's a lot of hard work. It's I'm still many years from being at a place where everything runs pretty smoothly with, mm -hmm. with a bunch of employees. I do think leveraging technology helps. I would say a virtual assistant is what helped take us to the next level in giving us time to focus on other areas of the business. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily say I have a ton of time today to you know, lay out on a beach and enjoy my life that much because I'm still in, in growth phase. But there are just some things that you just need a warm body for. Mm -hmm. And uh, virtual assistants, especially from the Philippines, are incredibly cost effective. Mm -hmm. uh, their English is pretty good and they can really pass for, for someone that's that's local. Yeah. So I'd say getting, I think a virtual assistant is also your first step to having an, a sort of an employee. And, and that's really how you scale long term. You have to find business partners that you trust that can take on certain responsibilities and also pay employees who can take on some of the, the admin mm -hmm. tasks. Yeah, and I'll I'll just double down on that. And I I've got two virtual assistants, and I've got a podcast editor. Um, you know, my my podcast editor is we're talking with him about taking on a little more where he's doing more than just the editing. But th those were the first people I put in place, and you know, I've got certain things that I I farm out to to one virtual assistant. Other things I farm out to the other virtual assistant based on you know what they're able to do. And I'm going to hire somebody really really soon. You know, so. That hire now, granted, I've been doing this for four years now. We've had a couple of properties come full cycle. And, you know, I'm, I'm at the point right now to where I can hire somebody, which is nice. But, you know, the, the virtual assistants are very cost effective. You know, I'm paying less than minimum wage for my virtual assistant in India, less than the U.S. minimum wage. And I'm paying slightly more than the U.S. minimum wage for my virtual assistant in the Philippines, you know, so like very, very cost effective. And you you can offload a lot of tasks onto them that, you know, can help you, you know, spend your time doing the more important things, whatever you choose that, whatever you deem that to be. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, Jason, as an operator, what what are your biggest tasks that you're that you're actually delegating to your VA? Or, you know, if you just hired somebody on your team, what what sort of things do you actually delegate to them versus reserve for yourself? That's a great question. I I still typically oversee most of the important decisions that are related to making financial choices, mm -hmm. but anything that involves admin tasks that are easily repeatable, that take a lot of time, but that you don't want to do yourself uh, is definitely something that I pass off to my virtual assistant. Stuff like uh, checking the tax bills every quarter, pulling them and putting them in a folder so that you know, when tax season is due, I have one place I can go and just easily pay all of them at the same time. Yeah. Uh, anything that's uh, like, sometimes I have her log into uh, Appfolio or Buildium mm -hmm. and pull some key metrics that I want to make sure uh, indicates that our property management company is is doing their jobs. And even on posting on social, I, I post a lot across LinkedIn and Facebook. It, it's rarely ever me. <laughs> Uh, so I have her monitor my Facebook chats to see if anyone messages me. Sometimes I'll have to respond to log in and respond if it's a complex question uh, or I'll respond to a comment myself. But yeah, all of my social posting is, is pretty automated through, uh, I forget what the platform we use is, but um, yeah, I think it's called Buffer and then through uh, using a virtual assistant. So uh, th there's a limit to what I think you can give to a virtual assistant. You can't give them accounting. You can't give them complex like copywriting, but mm -hmm. there is still a lot of stuff that might not be worth your time that you just have to kind of sift through your day, determine if it's easy enough that you could train, you mm -hmm. know, someone with a, a basic degree to do. Uh, and that's what you give. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, a lot of it's, it's boring. It's, it's expense reconciliation It's checking our bank account. Uh, it's making sure that tenant leases have been sent out. Uh, it's making sure that due dates are, are accurate or if they need to be updated. Yeah. And I, I would say, you know, look at what you're good at and look at your, your big money-making activities. You know, what are the things that, where, where you thrive at doing? 
and look at the other end of that spectrum. What are things that you're not very good at that are things that you don't like doing? I think those are the first things you offload. And there are some virtual assistant placement firms where if you need the, I guess, the more educated virtual assistant, like like uh, the things Jason mentioned, like the copywriters or um, the the bookkeepers or the the people who can do some finances for you, you can actually find people to do that. It's going to cost you more. You know, it's it's not going to be, you know, you're not going to get the six dollar an hour virtual assistant to do that. But you know, you might get a ten dollar virtual uh, an hour virtual assistant in you know the Philippines or India who can. So, but yeah, I, I would say really, you know, look at those minimum wage tasks that you don't like doing, and those are the first things you offload. So at what point would you actually hire somebody on your team or a VA when you're just starting out like me? Or would you say, you know, get a property under your belt and you've got some tasks that you can hand off? Because, uh, you know, as a dad and a W-2 worker and trying to get into real estate, there's a lot of things, but, you know, money might be kind of tight. So at what point would you actually go out and hire your first VA when you start making money with real estate? Or would you, you know, spend some money first? in order to get you to that first property. I would argue that if you are only hiring a VA after you're making money, you're you're probably too late. Then you're you've taken on a lot of work that you probably shouldn't have over many months, if not years. I think you will have to eventually make a hard decision to invest in yourself because mm-hmm. the journey to even acquiring a property, there's a lot of boring repetitive tasks that most VAs can do that you don't really need to be a part of. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, the the inflection point when I made the decision to hire a VA was when I had a bunch of stuff on my to-do list every single day, I just kept pushing off that I knew was really easy to get done. I just didn't have the bandwidth to do it because I was meeting brokers, I was underwriting deals. Uh, that's when I determined that it's worth it to invest in this business so that I can actually get some of those tasks done and then scale because that's essentially what it will help you do. It'll free up your time so you can focus on higher priority tasks and needs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and honestly, at the end of the day, even a full-time VA is only a few thousand dollars a year. It, it's not that expensive. Yeah. Uh, typically, the yeah, good ones will go for six, even maybe even seven bucks an hour. Mm-hmm. You can get one still for four to five if you're you know, being a little stingy, mm-hmm. but it, it won't break the bank. So I, I think it's definitely a worthwhile investment. Yeah, but what somebody told me, and I, I think it's accurate, you know, from where I'm sitting right now, I asked the same question a long time ago. And, and the answer I got back was, if you think you need a virtual assistant, you probably needed one six months ago. All right. So if you're at the point where you're questioning, do I need a virtual assistant right now? The answer is yes, you do. And you probably needed one three months ago. So I think that's, you know, lo- looking back at, you know, how long it took me to hire a virtual assistant. And, you know, what the difference was once I had that virtual assistant hired. Yeah, I think that's true. Well, anyway, we are out of time. Great conversation, guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, a lot of asset management stuff on there, which is, like, like like you said, Jason, it's overlooked a lot. Thanks for focusing on that a lot. And uh, one more question for each of you before we close shop. And Jason, you go first. How can listeners learn more about you? I'm pretty active on social, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram. My handle is just my full name, Jason, Mm -hmm. J-A-S-O-N-B-A-I-K. Depending on when this comes out, I might have started my YouTube channel by then because I'm I'm planning to to start one myself to try and make some content. And my handle will be be at Jason Bake. And you you Uh, say your content's going to be focused on asset management too, right? uh, Asset management, underwriting, just general investing principles uh, coming from the perspective of a a data-driven guy. All right. So check him out on YouTube, give him a follow on social media, and uh, we'll have links to everything he mentioned in in the show notes. And Mason, same question for you. How can listeners learn more about you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, uh, Mason Mattioni, just my full name. Also, same thing on Facebook. You can find me in Mason Mattioni, but also feel free to cold call me or text me. Uh, I'm pretty active on my phone too. Got that thing on me. Uh, (laughs) 916-952-3477. That's my cell. Give me a Give me a call and we can talk uh, or text and I'll, I'll get back to you. All right. And once again, we'll have that in the show notes. So yeah, feel free. And oh, by the way, if you're ever reluctant to, to talk with people, if they're giving you information, how to contact them, it means they want to. So anyway, that said, thanks guys for coming on the show. Appreciate your time and uh, love the talk. Thanks so much, Brian. Thanks, Brian. 
Hey, if you like that episode, make sure to subscribe. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to thetribeoftitans.info and we'll see you there. Thank <laughs> you.